This podcast contains descriptions of violence against children and adult language and is not suitable for all audiences. Listener discretion is advised. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Suffer the Little Children, the true crime podcast giving voices back to the victims of child abuse and shining a harsh spotlight on the parents, guardians, and caretakers who silence them. I'm your host, Lane, and this is episode 100, Sterling Cohen, part two. Last week, I began telling you the story of four-month-old Sterling Cohen, who was found dead in an infant swing in his dark, sweltering bedroom on August 30th, 2017. An investigation determined that Sterling had not been fed, changed, bathed, or moved from the swing for between 9 and 14 days prior to his death, which was caused by malnutrition, dehydration, and an infection from severe diaper rash. Both of Sterling's parents, Zachary Cohen and Cheyenne Harris, were arrested and charged with their son's murder. In this episode, I will tell you the rest of Sterling's story, including the results of both Zachary and Cheyenne's trials. This is the story of a baby boy whose parents valued their meth use and the care of their toddler daughter over the life of their newborn son. It's also the story of a little boy who was doomed from the start, but whose tragically short life touched the hearts of people around the world and who will never be forgotten. This is part two of the horrific story of Sterling Cohen. Before I jump into the second half of Sterling's story, I'd like to take a moment to thank my newest patrons, Terry L. from Alexander, Arkansas, and Olivia Lynn from Kingston, New Hampshire. Thank you both so much for your support. To make a pledge and help keep the show going, you can visit patreon.com slash stlcpod. If you haven't yet listened to episode 100, the first part of Sterling's story, I recommend going back and listening to that episode before you listen to this one. As I mentioned in the last episode, at the trial, Zachary's last name was overwhelmingly pronounced Cain, but because he pronounced it Cohen in the 911 call, and his father and brother both pronounced it Cohen during their testimony, I'll be using that pronunciation. At the end of the last episode, I went over the testimony at Zachary Cohen's trial from DCI agent John Turbot, whose testimony took place over the course of two days. Now I'll pick up where we left off. On Thursday, November 1st, 2018, Zachary Cohen's jury heard from state medical examiner Dennis Klein, who testified about performing Sterling's autopsy and finding that the baby died from dehydration, malnutrition, and a total body E. coli infection resulting from his severe diaper rash. Each of those elements, he said, were severe enough on their own to have caused death. The malnutrition is something that I think has been going on for quite some time. Uh, The dehydration... um, Obviously, we can survive longer without food than we can without water. Um, So the malnutrition would probably come first, um, and then the uh, dehydration would come. And then also the infection. uh, There was a period of time that took for that skin to break down, and from the time that the bacteria first starts to enter and when it really gets into the bloodstream, um, that can vary from... Uh, maybe a couple of days to maybe several hours. Uh, If we take each of these uh, differently, so the the malnutrition as far as hunger, hunger is one of those major survival drives uh, in humans. And so uh, the hunger is going to be a a feeling of discomfort to a child. They're going to respond by crying. And there's going to be this feeling that they, they may or may not understand, but it's going to respond in a verbal stimuli of crying. Um, Dehydration um, is going to vary. Uh, There's still a thirst drive 
that people are going to have that's one more powerful drives for survival is to make sure that you have enough fluids. So there would be some stimuli how that child understood that, I don't know, but that would be something that they would respond by crying. And then there is the infection component, which uh, when we have a fever, that's a generally uncomfortable feeling. Um, it's just they're going to respond to that uh, by being cranky and irritable. Um, and then finally, the rash. It's tender. It's going to be very painful for touching that area. As you start becoming more infected and you uh, become more dehydrated, um, your ability to actually respond and have um, what your awareness of these various stimuli, I think, would probably decline over time. It would probably be silent. Um, when children are, in, if they're sick, if they're dehydrated and they're malnourished, a child's, they're really their only real defense mechanism is making noise so that someone can help them. And that's one of the things that they lose in all three of these things. The doctor stated that anyone who went near Sterling would have smelled his decomposing diaper. Um, in Sterling's case, the, um, the diaper and the feces that were accumulated and decomposing um, combined with the urine uh, would be, I think, the most noticeable thing. Uh, it would be a very noticeable, uh, pungent, unpleasant smell. Uh, there would be both of st stool and then almost a, it could even be almost like a sewage type of smell because it's decomposing feces. Dr. Klein led the jury through a series of photographs showing the wretched condition of the baby's body as he peeled away layers of urine-soaked blankets and clothing. He pointed out the maggots hatched within the layers of fabric, saying flies had first laid eggs there after being attracted by the feces in Sterling's diaper. Due to the extent of rigor mortis present, Dr. Klein said, Sterling could have been dead for eight hours or more before he was discovered. While the photos were shown, Zachary initially looked at the screen where they were being displayed, but after one of his attorneys leaned over and said something to him, Zachary looked away, rocked in his chair, covered his face, and held his head in his hands to avoid seeing the pictures. Random pieces of clothing had been stuffed around and under Sterling in the swing, including three onesies, a toddler jacket, infant mittens, and a sock, all of which were soaked with feces, urine, and sweat. Sterling, who had only gained a few ounces or 150 grams of weight since birth, should have weighed about 11 pounds, according to Dr. Klein, who ruled out heart defects, bowel obstructions, and organic brain issues. Anyone looking at Sterling during his final days, Dr. Klein testified, would easily have noticed that the baby's eyes and the soft spots on Sterling's head, or fontanelles, had sunken due to dehydration. Sterling's thymus gland, located in his chest, was abnormally small, indicating the baby was under ongoing stress. The child, when I did the autopsy, and you will probably get to see the photos, and you'll be able to see that the child looks looks like it's malnourished. It's uh, somewhat emaciated. Um, it does not look like a baby that has been fed and starting to have sort of that, that chunky baby appearance that one it usually interprets as a healthy baby. That's not the case. So that would be the first observation I think one could make. Um, the other is just the um, the odor. I think would be um, based on what I saw at autopsy that the feces were not fresh. That they had been there for a period of time. That just that day before that was probably the same diaper with the same decomposing feces. That would have a very distinct odor that one would notice. I think a normal interaction, though, as far as being able to make eye contact or follow your eye or have some sort of that engagement, um, given how dehydrated, malnourished, and infected the child was, I would expect the child would have been non-interactive uh, with a person who was trying to interact with them. Sterling had been wearing the same diaper long enough for the fly eggs to hatch into maggots, which were likely present while Sterling was alive. Dr. Klein also said the diaper rash caused the baby's skin to deteriorate, allowing bodily fluids to exit and bacteria, such as E. coli, to enter, causing a massive infection. On cross, the defense attempted to quibble with the medical examiner, succeeding in getting the doctor to agree that homicide, a manner of death, is not the same as murder, a legal definition. 
Forensic entomologist Timothy Huntington, who also gave testimony at the 2008 murder trial of Casey Anthony in Florida, testified at Zachary Cohen's trial, telling the jury about the developmental stage of the maggots, saying he determined the maggots had fed on the waste materials inside Sterling's unchanged diaper for between 9 and 13 days. He testified that the fact that the maggots were not present in Sterling's eyes or mouth showed they hatched when he was still alive. If the baby was dead for longer than a day, he said, there would be evidence of other insect activity. The insects themselves were scuttle flies, which are similar to fruit flies and tend to be attracted to garbage, and they were attracted in this case to the smell of Sterling's diaper, feeding on the feces and other waste inside the diaper rather than Sterling's flesh. So the species was identified as a, a, a fly called, commonly called the scuttle fly. Um, the fancy scientific name for it is Megacellia scalaris but I'm just going to call it a scuttle fly, since it's hard to spell. Um, that's a small, um, kind of brownish fly, uh, frequently seen around garbage cans or uh, dead animals. And um, you've maybe seen it in your kitchen. A lot of people think they're fruit flies, um, but they're actually scuttle flies. This is a fly that is more attracted to waste material, like garbage or feces, or things of that nature, not so much um, decomposing tissue like like a dead body. Um, This this is a separate kind of a case, um, and and the medical term for it is myiasis. So myiasis is maggots feeding on either the body itself or fluids coming from the body. Uh, There's lots of different types of myiasis, lots of different types of flies that can cause it. Um, typically people think about it as um, a wound myiasis where you have a, a festering necrotic wound that, that uh, is, is infected in a lot of dead tissue uh, and then the maggots get in there into that wound. Um, that, that type of myiasis is called traumatic or wound myiasis and that's not what this was. Um, this type is, is referred to as a facultative myiasis where the insects are feeding on um, uh, body fluids, in this case feces and other um, potential fluids coming from from wounds, um, which it's not really what we see usually um, with when we see maggots on on live humans, um, but but it does happen. You you don't find these flies um, in uh, laying eggs and and, and, uh, growing and developing in sanitary conditions. Um, You can get this fly if you have that festering infection wound. Um, It does happen. It's not very common, but it does happen. Um, But this this fly would not have been there without the presence of um, feces and and urine and and potentially the other body fluids um, there. The flies began to lay eggs when Sterling likely wasn't moving much, Huntington testified, saying the baby's movement would have frightened the insects away. Um, so any kind of movement uh, of, of, of the child would deter flies from, from trying to lay eggs at that point as well. It, it tells me that uh, very likely it was not in a, um, a state of, of normal mobility. Um, Thinking about you know kicking legs, for example, in a child that would shoot flies away. Um, you know, waving of arms would shoot flies away, um, and so it, it is extremely likely that he was not very mobile at that point. And other humans moving around a child could shoot flies away. Too. Absolutely. After three days of witness testimony, the state rested its case, and the defense picked up where they left off first arguing before the judge, without the jury present, that Zachary's charges should be dismissed. Judge Stokel ruled the trial would continue. At that point, the defense called its first witness, DCI agent Chris Calloway, who testified that Cheyenne was the last person who admitted to feeding Sterling. The defense also called Zachary's father and brother as witnesses, asking about their Mennonite faith, including gender roles in child care. Willis Cohen, who lived in Oklahoma with his wife and grandson, told the court that his Mennonite family adopted their youngest son, Zachary, as an infant, 
taking the baby from his origins in California to move with them to Northeast Iowa when he was 18 months old. According to Willis, Zachary graduated from the Mennonite school when he was 14 after finishing 8th grade, which he said was typical for their community. Afterward, Zachary worked at various jobs, but he was excommunicated from the Mennonite faith at around age 16. Zachary had previously told investigators his excommunication was due to drinking and smoking. Willis testified that Zachary and his first son's mother were still married, although their son came to live with Willis and his wife when he was just weeks old because of his mother's mental issues. He's lived with us almost his whole life because after he was born, uh, Zach and his wife were having stresses in their marriage. Uh, His wife had, had quite a few emotional stresses, mental, and it caused a lot of stress in the marriage and he was holding the full, full-time job by then, and, and they both felt it was best to give the security needed. So they asked my wife and I to take legal guardianship of him. Zachary's oldest brother, Danny Cohen, who lived in Mississippi, testified that Zachary was concerned about Cheyenne's ability to parent. Was there being a new mother? I think he had some questions if she was capable or not. Just like I said, with her being a newer mother, he... And him being gone and just being a a young single parent, I believe it would have been a question. Danny said Zachary, his younger brother, regularly called him and texted him photos of Sterling, who neither Danny nor Willis had ever met. His brother had told him once that because of the amount of time he spent out of the house working, Zachary didn't believe Sterling was actually his. Danny said Zachary babysat Danny's children when they were babies and knew when the babies were hungry or needed to be changed. He had regular contact with Zachary during Sterling's short four months. Zachary never mentioned Cheyenne being depressed or that anything was wrong with the baby. Zachary once asked Danny if he would take Sterling if things didn't work out with Cheyenne. A Mennonite deacon and family friend, Lynn Feaster, gave similar testimony about the traditional roles in Mennonite households, saying men were typically the breadwinners, while women cared for the home and the children. At the end of the day, the defense entered a motion to dismiss Zachary's charge of first-degree murder, saying the prosecution did not prove Zachary's intent to kill Sterling. The prosecution rebutted, saying that every time Zachary walked past Sterling's bedroom without checking on or otherwise helping the baby, he made a conscious choice. The judge ruled again that the charge would stand. On Friday, November 2, 2018, Zachary Cohen took the stand in a move not many defense attorneys are bold enough to make, that is, allowing their client to speak for himself. On the stand, Zachary laid the blame for Sterling's death squarely at the feet of his ex-girlfriend, Cheyenne Harris. Zachary testified that he typically worked 70 to 80 hours a week, explaining that he underreported his hours in his logbook due to transportation regulations limiting truck drivers' hours on the road. When he got home from work, he said, he usually went to sleep and got about four or five hours of sleep per day. He and Cheyenne had opposite sleep schedules, and Sterling usually slept while Zachary was off work. He did not wake or check on the baby, he said, because Sterling was colicky and not a good sleeper. He said Cheyenne had instructed him not to disturb the baby while he was sleeping. During his testimony, Zachary admitted he had never changed one of Sterling's diapers and had only ever changed his daughter's wet diaper once. I don't do well with uh, diarrhea. I stick to vomit. I physically can't. I still can't take it. I have a very, very weak stomach. He said he once overheard Cheyenne and her doctor discussing the baby blues, saying he saw a pill bottle for the antidepressant Lexapro among her things while they were moving, but she never told him she was depressed. If she had, Zachary testified, he would have taken her for treatment. He did, however, admit that he and Cheyenne discussed allowing his brother, Danny, to care for Sterling. Danny was fine with the idea, but Cheyenne wouldn't hear of it. Regarding his drug use, Zachary testified that he began using meth when he was 17. Because we were working pretty long hours in uh, moving slurry. We ran 24-hour shifts, and so I was introduced to it. 
He said he only used meth when he had to drive his truck, but Cheyenne also used the drug, which he gave to her, because if he didn't, she became difficult to deal with. Sterling's bedroom was kept dark, Zachary said, which was made evident by the fact that Sterling would squint when brought into the light. For the last few weeks of Sterling's life, he said, whenever Cheyenne brought him out of the bedroom, he was tucked into a car seat and covered in blankets. He had noticed the foul smell in the apartment, Zachary said, so on August 28, 2017, after playing with Sterling in the swing, he removed a bag of dirty diapers from Sterling's bedroom. He asked Cheyenne about the smell, and she explained that milk had spilled on the baby's car seat and gone sour. He said he had no interaction with the baby on August 29th, in direct contradiction to what he had previously told authorities. Describing the day of Sterling's death, Zachary told the court that he went to sleep around 6 a.m. and Cheyenne woke him later, on her knees, crying hysterically. Uh, she came into the foot of the bed there, and I was sleeping, and she dropped her knees and was crying hysterically, and kept saying, he's gone, he's gone. Couldn't, she couldn't speak for a while. She was, she was distraught, and uh, I had to ask her, quite a few times questions so she could actually answer that I can understand. She said he's, he's gone, he's gone, and uh, then uh, I asked who's gone, and she said, Sterling. It took some time to call 911, he said, because he couldn't get a signal, so he walked around outside, smoking a cigarette, while he tried to get a signal. When asked to describe how he felt after Sterling's death, Zachary said he cried privately. It was, uh, like someone punched me in the chest, I couldn't get air. I was just, I was in disbelief and shock. I would have called it shock. And the other people had different conceptions of shock, but it was just, I was a lot. Under cross examination by Prosecutor McAllister, Zachary admitted to failing Sterling as a father. Can you explain to the jury how it was that you were well fed, Cheyenne was well fed, and well fed and your son was dying of malnutrition in the back bedroom. I cannot explain that. You have no explanation. I put my trust in the wrong person. And that's what you do wrong. I believe so, yes. Yeah. Now Leo is a dog, right? Yes. Did you care for Leo? I did. Dog has to be fed, right? Yes. Can't be himself. No. Dog has to be water, right? Yep. Can't get water for a dog. No, I can't. Did you give that dog food? Yes. Did you give that dog water? I did. I assume you didn't want that dog using your apartment in the bathroom, right? Correct. Put the dog outside? Yes. Would you agree that you took better care of wheels than you did your own son? Um, the way it looks, yes. How would you explain that? Um, I put the trust in the wrong person. You think as a father you have any responsibility to make sure that your child living in your house is well cared for? Yes. Sir. And did you fail that responsibility? I did. What did you do wrong? I should have uh, stepped up, but I had my trust in the wrong person. If I would have known, I would have definitely stepped up. In a weird attempt to show that Zachary did not neglect his son, the defense introduced evidence that the weekend before Sterling's death, Zachary drove to Twin Falls, Minnesota, to trade leftover meth for baby supplies, including bottles, blankets, and toys. What a prince! The state questioned Zachary about a previous job he held, hauling manure in a truck. You told the jury that you didn't change diapers because you had a weak stomach, right? That's true. And you couldn't handle the smell of feces, right? Yes. But you worked in a manure hauling company? Uh, human feces and animal feces are different in my nose. Your nose is better body? Of course. As reported by Kathy Russon of the Law and Crime Network, after Zachary stepped down from the stand, one juror had a meltdown. The judge excused the juror, who would be replaced by one of the alternates. At the end of the day Friday, court was adjourned for the weekend, set to resume on Tuesday. On Tuesday, November 6th, the final witness was University of Iowa psychology professor Michael O'Hara, who specialized in perinatal mental health since 1979, including postpartum depression. 
As a witness for the defense, Professor O'Hara had been hired to review depositions, interviews, records, and evidence to give an opinion on Cheyenne's mental status. Although he was not given the opportunity to examine her personally, nor was he given access to her medical records. Professor O'Hara testified that he could competently say that Cheyenne Harris likely suffered from depression, basing his opinion on the fact that Cheyenne had been prescribed Lexapro after her daughter's birth and the fact that a doctor two years prior had considered Cheyenne depressed. Other factors suggesting depression, O'Hara said, were the family's history of frequently moving, Cheyenne's young age while having two children under two years of age, and financial stress and domestic conflict between her and Zachary. According to a relative, Cheyenne had a history of self-harming behavior, including cutting as a teenager. According to O'Hara, depression could make it more difficult for someone to parent appropriately, and it would not be difficult to mask the signs of depression until it became severe. In her closing argument, Prosecutor Timmons told the jury that the defendant was given a blessing when Sterling was born, but that in four months, Zachary allowed his blessing to die a torturous death from starvation, dehydration, and infection. Every time Zachary came home and didn't care for Sterling was a separate act of neglect, she said. The prosecution alleged that Zachary's possible motive may have been that he simply did not want Sterling in the first place and didn't believe the baby was his. Exacerbating the situation was Zachary's methamphetamine habit. He spent anywhere from $140 to $280 a week on meth, which he also provided to Cheyenne. The defense's closing argument asked the jurors to find Zachary not guilty, explaining that he was too busy working to provide for his family to notice the signs that his girlfriend suffered from depression and was neglecting their baby. When the case was turned over to the jury at 12.50 p.m. on Tuesday, November 6, 2018, the five men and seven women deliberated for under an hour before returning with a verdict, finding Zachary Paul Cohen guilty of first-degree murder and child endangerment. Zachary reportedly showed little emotion as his verdict was delivered, despite the knowledge that a murder conviction in Iowa carried a mandatory sentence of life in prison. Less than a month later, news emerged that Zachary Cohen was seeking a new trial. Defense attorney Stephen Drahozel's argument was that evidence did not support his client's murder charge because none of the actions Zachary took directly led to Sterling's death and that Iowa's murder statute did not cover inaction. In the motion, the defense wrote, there is no evidence that the defendant intentionally starved, dehydrated, or otherwise caused Sterling's death. At best, the evidence showed that the defendant neglected Sterling. In other words, the state introduced evidence that the defendant's inaction, rather than actions, contributed to Sterling's death. However, in her challenge, Prosecutor Timmons disagreed, saying there was no way Zachary was unaware of his son's condition, because even Zachary admitted to entering Sterling's bedroom during the baby's last days. Every action the defendant chose to do in that apartment that did not involve caring for Sterling was a choice, an act, which led to Sterling's death. Choosing to let your child slowly die a painful death is no less unlawful than beating your child's head against a wall until the child dies. At the beginning of Zachary's sentencing hearing on December 4, 2018, Prosecutor Timmons said of the convicted, He was aware of what was going on, and he chose to do nothing. Defense attorney Drahozel argued, there are multiple instances in the law imposing an affirmative duty not to kill. That conduct is prohibited under law. However, it is a different crime, not murder in the first degree. Judge Stokel denied the defense's motion for a new trial and proceeded with the sentencing hearing. Because a conviction on a first-degree murder charge yields a mandatory life sentence in Iowa, neither the defense nor the prosecution argued for or against the punishment. For sentencing purposes, the child endangerment charge merged with the murder charge. None of Sterling's relatives attended the hearing, at which Zachary appeared wearing a striped jail uniform and a ballistics vest. He remained silent throughout the entire hearing, not saying a word. Prosecutor Denise Timmons said to the court, This is a mandatory sentence. There's not much more that needs to be said. There are no victim impact statements or anyone else to speak on behalf of the child. At the conclusion of the hearing, Judge Stokel sentenced Zachary Paul Cohen to life in prison without parole for the murder of his four-month-old son, Sterling Daniel Cohen. His attorneys quickly appealed his conviction, again arguing that there was not sufficient evidence that Zachary intended for his son to die, and stating that jurors should not have been shown post-mortem photos of Sterling. In November of 2020, the Iowa Court of Appeals upheld Zachary's conviction, saying there was enough evidence for jurors to convict him of first-degree murder. 
In the appeals court's opinion, Senior Judge Amanda Potterfield wrote, The smell of his unchanged diaper and the flies on and around him were apparent, especially in close quarters. Sterling's emaciated appearance made it clear he was in need of food and caring. There is substantial evidence for the jury to conclude that Cohen was aware Harris had stopped feeding and caring for Sterling, and yet Cohen chose to do nothing, an intentional withholding of the food and care Sterling needed to live. As for the matter of the postmortem photos, the opinion read, While photographs of small, dead children are likely to elicit emotion from the jury, death pictures are not ordinarily excluded because they are gruesome, as these pictures are, for murder is by nature gruesome business. In November of 2018, while Zachary Cohen's trial took place, 21-year-old Cheyenne Renee Harris appeared separately in court to waive her right to a speedy trial, which Zachary had also done. During the same hearing, the judge approved a venue change for Cheyenne's trial as well. Cheyenne's trial was scheduled to begin in the Plymouth County Courthouse in Lamars on January 29, 2019. According to a notice filed months earlier by defense attorney Aaron Haw Baker, Cheyenne's possible defenses included diminished capacity or intoxication. The notice also mentioned that the defense may call psychologists Dr. Michael O'Hara and Dr. Art Konar as expert witnesses. Prior to the trial, Prosecutor Denise Timmons asked the court to prevent the defense from arguing that Cheyenne's mental health or intoxication made her unable to form the specific intent to commit the crimes charged. Defense attorney Hawbaker requested the court to prohibit jurors from hearing any mention of Zachary's trial, arguing that his conviction would unfairly prejudice Cheyenne's case. Jury selection began as scheduled on January 29th, resulting in 10 men and 4 women being seated, two of whom would be alternates. Prosecutor Coleman McAllister gave a similar opening statement to the one he gave at Zachary's trial, customizing it for Cheyenne's actions. Near the end of this clip, you might notice the prosecutor begin to choke up as he described Sterling's last days. The evidence in this case will show that Sterling suffered in the last hours and days before his death. His body racked by fever from infection, with maggots feeding on his body's fluids, on the contents of his diaper, laying in urine and feces, soaked clothing. And at that time, his mother wasn't out of state. She wasn't across town. She was in the next room in that little apartment, ignoring his cries, ignoring his basic needs, ignoring her child, to lay in the swing, unloved, uncared for, and unaided by his mother. In addition to Aaron Hawbaker, Cheyenne was also represented by public defender Nicole Watt, who told the jurors during an opening statement that took just over one minute in its entirety, There's no doubt that this case is is a terrible case. It's a tragedy. You're going to wonder what kind of monster could do something like this. The monster in this case is mental health. The monster in this case is depression, postpartum, substance abuse. You're going to hear evidence in this case about Ms. Harris, what she was going through, how she suffered from depression, how she suffered from postpartum, and how she self-medicated. You're not going to hear in this case about the typical type of actions you might hear when you hear about child abuse. You're not going to hear about injuries. You're not going to hear about broken bones. You're not going to hear about bruises. You're not going to hear about any purpose on Ms. Harris's part to harm Sterling. You're not going to hear about any evil design or any plan or any ill will towards Sterling. You're not going to hear any evidence that she's evil. That's because she's not evil, and this this case is not murder. Thank you. Most of the witnesses called to testify during Cheyenne's trial were the same people who testified at Zachary's, and for the most part, were called in the same order. Deputy Jason Rossell told jurors that in the apartment, he found new diapers wrapped in rubber bands as if received as a gift, which were likely part of a diaper cake from the baby shower Brandy Harris threw for her daughter. 
the deputy also located a tube of baby ointment in Sterling's bedroom. In the kitchen cupboard, he found a three-quarters full can of blue Similac baby formula and a one-third full orange can of baby formula used for sensitive stomachs. Chief Deputy Reed Palo testified that when he spoke briefly with Cheyenne at the scene, she told him she had fed Sterling about four ounces of baby formula the night before his death. She also told him she had stopped taking her medication for postpartum depression because it made her sick. DCI agent James Teal, who documented the crime scene, gave the jury a virtual tour through the hundreds of crime scene photos he took. In the living room, he pointed out toys belonging to Sterling's older sister. The home contained food for the family dog, and the fridge contained eggs, chocolate milk, hot dogs, and other food suitable for the adults and the toddler. A receipt from the High V supermarket, dated four days before the 911 call was made, showed that the family had spent $123 on food and other items, including milk, eggs, baby wipes, cola, chips, ham, macaroni and cheese, juice, hot dogs, and cookies. In the master bedroom, the agent pointed out the parents' bed and the playpen where their daughter slept. Sterling's room contained a mattress leaning against the wall, a car seat, a bouncy seat, and the swing, next to which was a bottle filled with formula so old it had separated, as well as scented wax packets. When prosecutors showed the jury photos of Sterling's body in the baby swing, Cheyenne broke down into sobs and was led from the courtroom, prompting the judge to call a recess. Other than that outburst, she was quiet throughout most of the trial, often leaving her head in her hands. Jennifer Shriver told the jury that she lived in another building in the same complex as Zachary Cohen and his family. In about June of 2017, after a storm knocked a large tree branch onto the building, Jennifer saw Cheyenne and her daughter outside. Cheyenne was upset because Zachary was at work, Jennifer said, and during that conversation, Jennifer learned that the couple had a baby. Even so, Cheyenne remained outside for 20 to 30 minutes without a way to monitor the baby inside the apartment. Later, Jennifer said, she offered to babysit to give Cheyenne an opportunity to get out of the house. She testified that Cheyenne seemed kind of sad. As she testified in Zachary's trial, Jennifer said the first time she watched the children was in June of 2017. Sterling was happy and didn't fuss much. Cheyenne provided her with notes about caring for the children, which mentioned Sterling's diaper rash, for which she provided ointment. Jennifer estimated she changed Sterling's diaper about five times in the 17 hours she spent watching the kids on that occasion. Sterling took a bottle well, she said, consuming about six to eight ounces of formula per feeding. The second time she babysat for the kids, Jennifer testified, was in mid to late July of 2017. She said she interacted with Sterling and talked to him, and he would smile in return. When she saw Cheyenne and Zachary return to their apartment building after she had been caring for the children for about 16 hours, Jennifer received a text from Cheyenne, who said she would be over soon to get the kids, but she just needed a minute. When she hadn't arrived after a while, Sterling's sister ran out of milk and began to get fussy, so Jennifer took the children home to their apartment, where Cheyenne answered the door, huffed and rolled her eyes as if she wasn't ready to take her own children back. She didn't have much contact with the kids after that, Jennifer said, although the couple did ask her to care for their dog, Leo, for a few days after Sterling's death. Brandy Harris testified, saying she did not want to testify against her daughter and had only appeared because she was subpoenaed. Again, the judge ordered Brandy not to be photographed during the trial due to harassment and death threats she had received on social media. During her mother's testimony, Cheyenne appeared more emotional than she had at any other time during the previous witness's testimony, other than her outburst over the photos. At times, she could hardly tear her eyes away from her mother, often with the ghost of a smile on her lips. At other times, tears were visible in her eyes, or she stared at the table while wiping at her nose. When Sterling was born at a friend's house, Brandy said, she ran over to see the baby. I was freaking out because he was in a bathtub and just been born there, so I kind of wanted the ambulance there ASAP. Brandy reiterated that she had never been inside her daughter's Alta Vista apartment because of tension between Zachary Cohen and her side of the family. And you said Zach wasn't allowed at your house? No. Your your fiancé did not get along with Zach, is that right? No. That was based on reasons for the past history, the shy and stuff, so... You didn't like Zachary? No, I did not. 
Zach kind of felt the same way about us as we did him. So you want to welcome there by Zach? No. Um, why were you on the outside of the apartment? I did pick up the kids for visits and things when I got them. Prior to Sterling's death, how many times did you take care of Sterling? I think what I gathered from pictures was about four or five times. I based on pictures because I didn't know that any of this would be important. You know, how many times I had him overnight or how many times I just saw him or you know, any of that stuff. About her grandson, Brandy said. He was a happy baby. He'd kind of grumble a little bit and scrunch up his nose and, uh, and he knew he was kind of hungry. He never had to get to the chance to scream or yell. He was more of a baby that, you know, he'd start fussing and he knew that he needed, you know, something at that point in time. Now, as many of you know, I'm vehemently against victim blaming, and that includes innocent family members in the cases I talk about. Harassing and sending death threats to Sterling's grandmother is inexcusable behavior, least of all because she had absolutely nothing to do with it. Brandy seems like a caring grandmother who truly loved her two grandchildren. I do think it's worth mentioning here that while there's not much information available about Cheyenne's childhood, an article from the Globe Gazette dated August 23, 2010, shed a little light on the woman who raised Cheyenne Harris. Brandy married Rodney Harris in 2001. As a staff sergeant with the Iowa National Guard, Rodney was deployed to Iraq for 16 months in early 2006. While he was away, in April of 2007, Brandy moved with the couple's two children, including Cheyenne, to a home in New Hampton, abandoning the family's two dogs, two ferrets, and a cat in their former Charles City house, apparently because the lease on her new place did not allow pets. She did not return to feed the animals regularly. A woman named Patricia Strotman, who had power of attorney for Rodney Harris, entered the Charles City house in April of 2007 and later testified it was one of the most horrifying experiences she's ever had. The house was strewn with rotting food, filth, and excrement everywhere. She found a puppy in a cage, emaciated, covered in feces, without food or water, and a ferret in the same condition in a separate cage. Rodney's father, Philip Harris, also entered the house at that time and testified that he found a second ferret dead in a shoebox. The house had to be completely gutted due to the odor of animal waste permeating the walls, carpet, and underflooring. The damage cost to the home exceeded $2,500. Brandy was charged with second-degree criminal mischief. In 2010, she waived her right to a jury trial and was found guilty, and 32-year-old Brandy received a five-year suspended prison sentence, a $750 suspended fine, and three to five years probation. She was also ordered to undergo a mental health evaluation and to follow through with any recommended treatment. Again, that information is not necessarily pertinent to Sterling's murder case, but it does provide a little window into Cheyenne's childhood and her parental influences. DCI agent Chris Calloway testified that when he interviewed Cheyenne, she told him she last fed and changed Sterling on August 29, 2017, at which time she was interrupted by her young daughter knocking on the baby's bedroom door. She told him, I put him back in the swing and gave him the bottle and turned it on and went to see what she wanted. She told the agent that she kept her kids separated because her daughter didn't like Sterling. Once, when Sterling was in his swing in the kitchen, his sister knocked the swing over. Cheyenne also kept the kids separated because Sterling got cold easily, she told him, so she kept the baby's bedroom warmer than the rest of the apartment. During the testimony of medical examiner Dr. Dennis Klein, while postmortem photos of Sterling were shown, Cheyenne averted her gaze and covered her eyes. Some jurors also looked away to avoid seeing photos of skin sloughing off Sterling's body and diaper rash extending halfway up his back and chest. Forensic entomologist Timothy Huntington testified again, and I have to confess, I found his testimony at both trials fascinating. The fact that insects can be used to learn so much about a crime, including whether those insects infested antemortem or postmortem, has always interested me, and I think Dr. Huntington's testimony was a huge piece of the puzzle that composed Sterling's final days. Sterling was awake during this process and alive. Could he have felt this, the flies and the maggots crawling on him? Yes. Do you know what that feels like? I, I, I've held maggots and, and flies on a number of occasions, um, and 
it, it's a it's a crawling sensation. Um, if you've ever held a a caterpillar or an earthworm or something like that, there's there's little bristles on the underside that that you can feel. Um, in reports of people that have uh, wound myiasis, for example, report a crawling sensation, and certainly in a sensitive area like the the urogenital area, you would feel it. Sterling had an infection from the diaper rash, the raw, and he had that raw skin. Could the maggots have been feeding on his body as well? Yes. Can you explain that? Scuttle flies are one of those flies that can eat a wide variety of things. Um, so certainly they will eat feces and rotting tissues of, of any kind. And so um, in this case, while there's not a well-defined wound, like a, like a cut or a laceration or something like that, the skin sloughing off the body as it, as it was uh, would certainly be a food source that the maggots could use. After the state rested its case, and before the defense began presenting its case, Attorney Hawbaker notified the court that the defense wanted to call Zachary Cohen as a witness. Zachary exercised his Fifth Amendment right against self-incrimination, thereby avoiding testifying, just as Cheyenne had during his trial. However, Zachary's testimony from his trial was read at Cheyenne's, including information about Zachary providing Cheyenne with meth and refusing to change diapers because the smell made him sick. Toward the end of Cheyenne's trial, the state of her mental health in August of 2017 took center stage. Psychologist and professor Dr. Michael O'Hara was called again as an expert witness for the defense. By this time, he had met with Cheyenne for about two and a half hours and administered tests covering the symptoms of depression. Under direct examination by defense attorney Hawbaker, Dr. O'Hara testified that he was able to diagnose Cheyenne. So there were really three diagnoses that seemed to capture her um, mental condition. One was uh, major depression uh, at a severe level, recurrent uh, with what we call peripartum onset, which simply means the beginning, an episode that begins during pregnancy or early in the postpartum period. Uh, second diagnosis was uh, post-traumatic stress disorder or what's often called PTSD. Uh, and the third diagnosis was uh, essentially substance abuse, uh, severe, uh, uh, with uh, stimulant uh, medication, uh, methamphetamine in particular. Post-traumatic stress disorder uh, is uh, a disorder that we recognize now for quite a long time. Uh, it is usually thought to begin with some sort of a traumatic experience. So the PTSD, uh, she reported to me um, during the interview that she had had a, a lengthy history of being sexually abused by her uh, father. Uh, this went on for a couple of years. On cross-examination, Prosecutor Denise Timmons got Dr. O'Hara to admit that because he didn't examine Cheyenne until December of 2018, the vast majority of the information on which he based his opinion was self-reported by Cheyenne. The prosecutor also mentioned that Cheyenne had told Dr. O'Hara she didn't want to change Sterling's diapers and was tired of hearing him cry. She also told the psychologist that her daughter would get upset if Cheyenne paid attention to the baby. During your interview with the defendant, she admitted to you that she did not want anything to do with Sterling. Uh, she said that. Um, she was, uh, I think, that disturbed. But yes, that was part of the interview. You say that disturbed. It could be that's just how she felt, though, correct? Well, the, that she would be feeling that way about her son, who on another occasion said how much she loved him, um, that that level of impairment in her uh, functioning would be, um, I would call that quite disturbing. Psychiatrist Dr. James Dennert, an expert witness the state called on rebuttal, testified that Cheyenne was able to care for herself, her daughter, and the home, which he wouldn't expect her to be able to do under the hold of depression as deep as she claimed. Neither in, in what Ms. Harris told me about what was going on, nor in the record do I find anything that indicates to me that she was so severely impaired that she could, without knowing it, 
watch her infant son starve to death. That would require a pretty significant level of impairment that I just don't see and hasn't been described to me by Ms. Harris, nor do I see it in the record. One particularly disturbing piece of testimony from Dr. Dennert was this. She did make a statement to me that that at the time, uh, as she looks back, she realizes that she thought that Sterling was the reason her family was messed up. She told me when I talked to her that now she looks back on that and realizes that was illogical. But at the time, that's, she said that's how she was, was thinking. Cheyenne's attorneys opted not to put their client on the stand during her trial. After both sides presented closing arguments on February 6, 2019, the case was handed over to the jury, which deliberated for four hours before returning with a verdict. We, the jury, find the defendant guilty of murder in the first degree. Count two, we, the jury, find the defendant guilty of child endangerment causing the death of a child. The defense in Cheyenne's case, just as in Zachary's, attempted to have Cheyenne's conviction for first-degree murder overturned. In a motion to the court, Attorney Hawbaker wrote, There was no evidence presented showing the intentional use of force, torture, or cruelty. The state's position that the result of the deprivation of food was torturous and cruel is misguided and places the emphasis on the result and not the method or acts of torture and cruelty as required by statute. He did, however, admit the evidence supported his client's conviction of child endangerment. Once again, Assistant Attorney General Denise Timmons fought back, writing, Instead of providing her child the help he needed to survive, the defendant instead chose to put a heavy blanket over the window to dampen sound and smell, place air fresheners underneath the swing to cover up the smell, and to continue her life as if nothing was wrong in the back room. Sterling, suffering for the length of time he did at the hands of his mother, is nothing but torturous and cruel. At Cheyenne's sentencing hearing on February 19, 2019, she sat quietly in her striped jail outfit and large orange coat, declining to address the court. Once again, none of Sterling's family members were present for Cheyenne's sentencing. Cheyenne remained emotionless as Judge Stokel handed down her mandatory sentence of life in prison without parole. Less than a month later, the Iowa Court of Appeals upheld the termination of Cheyenne's parental rights to her daughter, stating in its decision that Cheyenne did not challenge the grounds for the termination and agreed she would not be available as a custodial parent due to being imprisoned for life. A memorial service was finally held for Sterling in June of 2019, nearly two years after his death, at the Alta Vista Municipal Hall, at which community members, extended family members, and first responders gathered to pay their respects to the tiny baby who had touched the hearts of so many. Chief Deputy Reed Palo told the Waterloo Cedar Falls Courier, It will be an opportunity for the community to come together. This is the first chance we have had to take a breath after all the court stuff. We wanted, more than anything, to do something for Sterling. He's never had a service or anything. Deputy Palo said that Sterling's death had a deep impact on everyone involved in the case, from first responders to investigators to social services to prosecutors, who all had to fight to stay detached while doing their jobs and pursuing justice for Sterling. A case like this is going to affect you for the rest of your life. You don't have an opportunity to grieve. You don't have an opportunity to process the emotional side. You didn't get a chance to have an emotional response. I've said it many times in the past, but I have such a deep respect for the first responders and law enforcement and others who continue fighting the good fight despite being emotionally scarred and traumatized by the horrific, upsetting deaths of children they witness. I can't imagine how they carry on doing their jobs after witnessing things I struggle even to talk about, and my respect for them is tremendous. Sterling's funeral arrangements and headstone were donated by the Huge Back Johnson Funeral Home. At the memorial service, a photo of Sterling was displayed, on which were printed words from Matthew 19.14. Jesus said, Let the little children come to me, and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. Former prosecutor Coleman McAllister, by then a district court judge, gave Sterling's eulogy, saying, Every life is precious. You're all here out of mercy to honor Sterling's life. 
It was a tragic life, but it had meaning. Minister Gordon Holdeman led a prayer during the ceremony. The local Mennonite choir sang This Little Light of Mine. Judge McAllister said during the eulogy, Sterling impacted everyone who came in contact with him. I will never forget Sterling. There's nothing I could do in my life that could make me forget him. I choose to remember him as he is in the photograph, smiling, big blue eyes, a precious gift from God. First responder Tony Friedrich also spoke at the funeral, saying, I want to thank all of you who showed up today, because by doing so, you showed you care. You showed that Sterling's life did matter, that there is good in this world, and there is hope. Sterling's life mattered. Sterling's life brought public awareness to safe havens, child endangerment, child abuse and neglect. He touched my heart. After the service, when many of the mourners walked through Alta Vista from the municipal hall to the cemetery, and the accompanying choir sang hymns, Deputy Palo carried the urn containing Sterling's ashes to his final resting place. As the procession passed, community members stood in silent respect. Sterling Daniel Cohen was laid to rest in Alta Vista's Union Cemetery. In 2020, BBC Two aired Stacey Dooley's documentary titled Locked Up with the Lifers, one episode of which caused some controversy among viewers. Focused on the Iowa Correctional Institution for Women in Mitchellville, the documentary demonstrated the ways the prison sought to create a more humane environment for its inmates who were serving life sentences. The inmates are allowed to have pets and to carry on romantic relationships amongst each other, and they are permitted to make phone calls whenever they please. In one segment of the episode, Stacy spoke with one inmate, none other than Cheyenne Harris, who is being held in a segregation unit after attacking another inmate. Cheyenne told the documentarian that she was struggling behind bars due to tension between herself and the other inmates, who were hostile and abusive toward her. I want to know why she's struggling. Why have they moved you up to this ward? Uh, because I got into my first altercation. A physical fight? Yeah. Why? This girl, she made a comment that was directed directly towards my ki- my charge and why I'm here and... Yeah, I turned around and beat the shit out of her. What did she say that made you so angry? Um, she said, yeah, bitch, that's why you killed your son. Did you kill your son? No. The courts clearly thought that you were responsible. If I hadn't been high on meth, I wouldn't, it never would have happened. I was not a good person when I was on meth and trying to be a mom. I wasn't. He was extremely neglected. Where did you find him? In his room in his swing. How long was he left alone for? Um, I can't say exactly sure how long he was left alone for. I think it was days. It was days before I went in there. You're clearly um, struggling mentally. Do you imagine this is how you will go on to exist? I don't know. Other people here say that that it gets better, that it won't be so hard. But in all reality, I think that's bullshit. Do you think you'll hurt for the rest of your life? Yeah, but I'll live. Do you want to live? Depends on the day. As soon as Cheyenne was returned to the general population, the other inmates reacted to her presence. Yeah, they know. Thank you. Okay. Oh, yeah. This is going to be fun. It's going to be real fun. I think Cheyenne's going to find the next few days really difficult. I heard them say something about Cheyenne's charge. Yeah, they don't fuck with her a lot. Yeah. Because of what she's in here for. Mm-hmm. Do you think that will continue? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. If not worse. Sometimes people like that, they might jump her in the bathroom. Cheyenne Renee Harris, who just this month turned 25 behind bars, 
remains incarcerated to this day in the same institution, which many believe is far too cushy and comfortable for the woman who allowed her son to rot in his baby swing while he died a slow, agonizing death. At the very least, she's in a unit that is far from one of the most comfortable in the prison. She has no privacy from the other inmates and is under constant surveillance. Zachary Paul Cohen, now 32, is serving his sentence in the Iowa State Penitentiary in Madison, Iowa. Other notable inmates include Charles Brown and Charles Kelly, two men who killed three people and wounded three others during a spree in 1961 and were subsequently the last two people ever executed by the state of Iowa. Unfortunately, there's not much left to say about baby Sterling that hasn't already been said. This has been a very difficult case to research and to tell because Sterling was so little, helpless, and completely dependent on his parents for care, and they utterly failed him in every conceivable way. In addition to his parents, Sterling was failed by hospital staff who never reported the presence of methamphetamine in his umbilical cord to the Department of Human Services as they were mandated by law to do. I hope whoever dropped that ball is haunted every day by the thought of what Sterling endured as a result of that failure. If Sterling was alive, he'd be turning four this year. Instead, he will forever be remembered as the baby who never had a chance. I absolutely can't bear to think that Sterling died in vain. If nothing else, I hope Sterling's short life and horrific death can serve as a warning to all of us to check on the children in our lives, especially those we haven't seen for a while or who are too small to speak up for themselves, and especially if we have any reason to believe their parents may not be capable of caring for them. Sleep well, baby Sterling. We will never forget you. My sources for this episode were the Waterloo Cedar Falls Courier, the Des Moines Register, the Washington Post, USA Today, Heavy, News 7 KWWL, The Charles City Press, Law and Crime, The Daily Mail, 9 ABC, The Globe Gazette, Web Sleuths, Twitter, Facebook, The Sun, Stacey Dooley's documentary, Locked Up with the Lifers, and the Iowa Department of Corrections website. That's it for this week. Join me next week for another story. If you like the show, please follow or subscribe to Suffer the Little Children on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, YouTube, Spotify, Spreaker, Pandora, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, or your favorite podcast listening app. And please leave me a five-star rating and a positive review on your favorite podcast platform. Visit the website at SufferTheLittleChildrenPod.com, where you can listen to episodes or become a patron for rewards ranging from a shout-out by name on the show to bonus content and exclusive gifts. Follow the podcast on Facebook, Instagram, Tumblr, and Pinterest at SufferTheLittleChildrenPod and on Twitter and TikTok at STLCpod. View photos related to today's episode on Facebook and Instagram. For more stories like the one you heard today, visit SufferTheLittleChildrenBlog.com. This podcast is researched, written, hosted, edited, and produced by Lane. All music for the show is licensed from AudioJungle.net. Email tips, comments, questions, or case suggestions to sufferthelittlechildren.pod at gmail.com. For more information about preventing or reporting child abuse, visit childhelp.org or call your area's child abuse hotline. If you see something, say something. Until next week, bye everyone.